Okay, first of all, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Yang Tang. I'm a maintainer of Coding as Project. Uh, joining me today is John Bellamerg. He is a committee member of uh, Coding as Project as well. John, maybe you can raise your hand. Okay. 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 Yeah, in today's session, we are going to discuss several things. First, we are going to discuss about uh, some community update of Coding as. Uh, as well as uh, interesting progress in s some of the features that have been recently added. And then I'm going to introduce a little bit of uh, survey discovery and coding as, and show an example of how coding as can be used to consolidate the different information from different cloud windows. And finally, I'm going to uh, do a deep dive of coding as and go through a demo plugin that allows uh, anyone uh, with the knowledge of Golang to write a coding as plugin in potentially like less than 100 lines of Golang code. Uh, and also, by the way, uh, if you have any question, you can certainly raise your hand. Uh, I'll try to answer as much as possible. And also, Jiang is here. Maybe Jiang can answer some more questions as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's first uh, discuss about coding as. So as many of you know, coding as is a CNCF, CNCF project. Uh, it's a flexible DNS server written in Go. Uh, unlike other DNS server, DNS project, CodeDNS has a focus on survey discovery. It, it is a, a plugin based, which means it can be easily extended. In other words, if you have any features uh, you're looking for, you can either uh, look for external plugin or internal plugin, or if you know how to write uh, if you know how to write in Golang, then you can write a plugin for, by yourself. Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, features of CodeDNS is that CodeDNS is a default DNS server in Kubernetes. So I guess anyone using, coding, uh, anyone using Kubernetes probably will use DNS, CodeDNS by default. In addition to, to be served as a D default DNS server, CodeDNS also support uh, different protocols. It support DNS, DNS over TOS, DNS over gRPC. It also support additional protocol like DNS over ATP. Uh, in, addition to, in addition to those different protocols, another thing CodeDNS uh, excels with is uh, consolidation of different cloud-related uh, cloud DNS information. For example, with CodeDNS, you can sync up with the AWS RAW 53, you can sync up with Azure DNS, or you can sync up with Google Cloud DNS. That gives you plenty of flexibility and allows you to consolidate in case you're doing a multi-cloud deployment. And finally, uh, CodeDNS was started by uh, Mick Gibbon uh, several years ago. Um, as of uh, recently, Nick Gibbon decided to uh, step down uh, from the project lead position. So we changed the structure a little bit. Now coding is, is uh, organized as a community-based uh, you know, uh, organization. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a, a project uh, coding as update since last KubeCon uh, early this year. Uh, there are several versions have been released uh, from 1.9.3 to 1.10. Uh, the latest release is 1.10.0. Uh, it was released last month. Uh, there are several plugins has been added since uh, last QuickCon. Uh, TSEC and the Vios are both interesting plugins, especially for Vio. The Vio plugin is uh, highly sorted after plugins uh, requested by many community, uh, community, mem uh, community members. Uh, it is a feature that, is, uh, that has been supported by other DNS servers. So finally, uh, in Core DNS, we are able to bring this feature into the default plugin so you can give it a try if you are interested in the Vio. Uh, we also have a focus, for the past several months, we also st uh, stress a lot of focus on security. Uh, as many of you know, for the past several years, security has been a big concern for, uh, for tech industry. Uh, since several years ago, things like a ransom attack, like uh, uh, the log4j, and also for increased uh, security-related events, uh, that all 
put everyone to be on high alert whenever there is a security event or whenever you are using a software that can be exposed to vulnerabilities. Uh, we fixed uh, two issues that's actually related to the upstream, not to the quality itself. But one is related to uh, Golang's crypto library. Another one is the uh, YAML package. Uh, and another, another thing that's related to security is that since 1.10.0, coding has been built with Golang 1.19 or higher. Why that's important? Because uh, uh, in, I believe in 1.9, coding has still built with... Uh, okay. So, sorry, that's a little bit of distraction with the background noise. Um, in coding as 1.10.0, uh, 1.9. Uh, earlier on, coding was built with Golang 1.17.6 or early. And unfortunately, Golang 1.17.6 or early consists of quite a few security issues. So because of that, I highly encourage everyone, if you're using coding as please, please upgrade to the latest version uh, to make sure your any usage is not going to be subject to security vulnerabilities. Here is the summary of coding as community progress. Uh, as of right now, we have uh, 332 contributors. Uh, a big thank to everyone who contributed to coding as repo. Uh, we also have 28 maintainers. I'm going to discuss about uh, how to become a maintainer uh, later, later on uh, in this session. Uh, but, this, uh, but coding as by itself is in a very, very much a flat structure. Uh, if you contribute enough, you can easily become a maintainer. So I also encourage anyone who has interest in, in DNS or interest in Golang, uh, maybe you can give it a try. Yeah. We have uh, 33 public adopters. Those are the uh, companies or institutions that are willing to share their name and made, made their name public. So those are the adopters. Uh, we also have uh, 9,800 stars. As you can see, it's closer to 10,000, so let's make a finishing touch. Let's uh, try to reach to uh, 10,000. No, so. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Amig uh, decided to step down from the project lead position uh, early this year. So after some discussion, we reorganized uh, 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 organi uh, re Codinus. So now it's in a steering committee model. Every year, a uh, committee member will be re-elected. Re uh, you have to become a maintainer for us to, to, be considered, uh, to be considered as a candidate for a uh, committee member. But like I said, uh, to be a maintainer is uh, very easy in coding as a community. So if you are willing to give a try, I highly encourage you to do so. Okay, uh, let me see. Okay, so next thing I'm going to discuss is about uh, survey discovery with coordinates why I bring this topic about survey discovery. Uh, in, in many cases, even as of right now, uh, every time I discuss about DNS with someone, uh, I always heard a lot of questions about DNS. The first question is that, okay, in this day and age, you have the SDN, you can e even assign an IP anywhere you want. So what's the purpose of DNS? Why do we still need DNS? And I see this question as, um, uh, as a valid question, but there is some legit reasons DNS is a nice thing you want to use. So first of all, DNS is uh, indirection. And this indirection is something going to help you in the future. Uh, with SDN, you can easily manipulate IPs. But even as of right now, it's not exactly straightforward to always modify the IP. For example, your IP might be associated with one cloud vendor. Now, if you are going to move from let's say Google Cloud or AWS or vice versa, you may not have, have a lot of freedom to move in uh, public IPs easily. In this case, a DNS uh, can help you to shield away from the IPs that are not so easy to change, but you can change the, uh, you, can, you can expose uh, uh, your customer with a DNS entry that will always be available and, will, and so that your customer will only need to reach to the DNS name that will not change over time. And also DNS is uh, flexible. Uh, you can use different ways to configure DNS. You can 
you know, you can use like a cloud vendors DNS, or you can use like core DNS locally, you can use like a bind file, or you can use some other things. Uh, another feature of DNS is that DNS can be both public facing and internal. That can be very useful in, in many organizations in case you have a VPN and you don't want to share a public, uh, public DNS record. Uh, another, another feature of DNS that's very interesting is that DNS is easy and simple to change, yet DNS itself is distributed. What does that mean? Because DNS by itself is a massively scalable distributed system. Many people didn't realize that because the whole internet is backed by DNS, right? Uh, and also DNS, uh, I, I guess most of the guys here are actually in the SIE or DevOps uh, organization or interested in Kubernetes or infrastructure. But there's another field like IT uh, organization. They also need to have a way to expose uh, services and the DNS, it's more like a bridge in between infrastructure guys or SIE guys and the IT guys. So it's more like a communication channel. So they can share the same interface, uh, exposing to both uh, corporate IT and to uh, infrastructure that's uh, exposing to exposing your service to to your customers. We discuss about uh, uh, core DNS and how core DNS can can be deployed with multi cloud. So why multi-cloud deployment can be interesting and uh, can be useful. And there are several reasons you want to use multi-cloud. Not necessarily say you have to use, but there are several reasons you may want to consider. One, you may have a limitation on data sovereignty and the data residency. As we all know, now different countries have different legal, uh, legal considerations and the different country may put a uh, lot of restriction on what kind of data can be exposed or how the data should be resident to certain countries. And in this case, you may not have always have a choice uh, with, respect to, with respect to certain uh, countries because not all the vendor, cloud vendors uh, are available in certain countries. Uh, another thing that's actually come to, to me is that I realized that uh, multi-cloud deployment might be a necessity if you ever engage in merger and acquisitions. I know that may not be a very uh, pleasant topic, but I mean, with the potential economic slowness, <laughs> MA might be a conversation you may encounter if you happen to be in operations uh, or happen to be a developer, right? If a company acquire, if a two company uh, has been uh, merged, or one company acquire another company, you may notice that uh, the choice of which vendor to use uh, does not depend on you know like uh, just one vendor. You may be forced to operate on multiple vendors, and after the uh, MA has been complete, it may not necessarily be true that you have an option to always migrate from one vendor to another because of a cost issue, right? If you try to talk to a CEO, say, hey, uh, uh, our company acquired one, one, one company, but this the other company, now it's one company, we have two vendors. One is on uh, AWS, another is on uh, Azure. Sometimes uh, your CEO may not be willing to spend a huge resource or money to say, hey, let's make a move from one vendor to another because there's no additional revenue or no additional benefit other than just uh, give operationally, give you a slight, uh, give you a slight advantage or simplify, simplification. Sometimes, you know, your, your CFO or CEO may just say, hey, you know what, let's just leave alone, right? And in this case, unfortunately, you do have to come up with a multi-cloud strategy, right? Uh, okay, uh, another thing with multi-cloud is, uh, and uh, core DNS is, uh, core DNS fits a gap on multi-cloud deployment because the core DNS can consolidate diversified information and you can consider core DNS as more like a, a single source of truth uh, with different back, uh, different, different DNS, inf uh, DNS information scattered around in like in AWS and Google Cloud or Azure as well as in your IT infrastructure and in your some local Kubernetes clusters, right? That's why the core DNS can easily fill in the gap, allow you to 
uh, allow you to you know to work in a heterogeneous environment. Uh, and finally, some people may argue that because nowadays everyone is talking about cloud, you may want to just use the cloud vendors. Uh, DNS solution, for example, you can use RAW 53. Why would you why would you want to use your local DNS? But there is one important thing that's actually from the lessons I learned for the past year or so. Is that the as of right now, as far as I know, all three cloud vendors all claim to have a hundred percent SCOA for their DNS service. RAW 53, Google Cloud, uh, DNS, and uh, Azure DNS. However, the SCOA is kind of misleading. What does SCOA mean? SCOA does not mean if, if there is a let's say a breach uh, breach of the SCOA, let's say uh, there is a downtime. What's the outcome of this downtime? The outcome of this downtime doesn't mean uh, AWS or AWS or Azure or Google will reimburse you your loss. It only means they are going to reimburse you the, the downtime of DNS service you paid during that period of time. Okay, now you, you probably get the idea. Uh, last, I think last year, or maybe early this year, I cannot remember, uh, the company I work for has a downtime due to one cloud vendor. I'm not going to reveal. <laughs> uh, after the downtime, we come to the cloud and say, hey, that's not acceptable. DNS is a highly sensitive service. What's going on? What should we do? Oh, we are going to reimburse you. Unfortunately, the money we spend on DNS is like $100 during that period of time. And the offer was, okay, do you guys want, to, want us to reimburse you the $100 or you guys want just like uh, give you some like Uber Eat gift card? But that, that, that was a conversation I had early, uh, like a year ago. So as you can imagine why you have to treat DNS very seriously and you cannot always count on cloud vendors because the SOA is misleading, right? So that's why, uh, at least for the company uh, I work for, we are in serious discussion about the potential set of a, a DNS server ourselves uh, with additional backup plans. So we can at least we can control what's going on. We don't need to wait for cloud vendor to fix some critical issues, right? Okay, uh, we, we talk about the multi-cloud, we talk about DNS. Another thing I'm going to discuss is about uh, how we can see coding how why uh, coding can be a good choice if you're going to do a cloud integrations. I mean, because many people may may think, okay, if uh, if you're going to do cloud integrations, what does what exact what ex, what the coding is do? So when coding is do cloud integrations, instead of using UDP transportation, we actually use a secure communication like ATP. So if coding as need to fetch information from raw 53, it will go through AWS API in ATPS, uh, and the data will be transferred through a TCP. The only, D, the only UDP uh, part, it's actually the front end of coding as. If you send a query to coding as, coding as will receive your UDP, UDP query, and it will pass information to raw 53 through a uh, secure ATP, get the information back and send back you the UDP uh, response. So why this is a, a better model? Because it's much secure and it's reliable. It has a better error handling. And uh, more importantly, we realize that in many situations, even though UDP has been simple enough, uh, TCP might give you a better optim optimization in many situations. That's because now there's not a lot of people using UDP. <laughs> so all the optimization at a different level, at your kernel level, at your hardware level, may have been geared toward TCP because nobody care about UDP, right? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you an example. This is the example I talk about, uh, how you can connect CodeDNS to allow CodeDNS to connect to multiple cloud vendors uh, and uh, serve as one front end. Uh, in this example, uh, the coding is, uh, behind coding is, there are three types of uh, 
uh, information. The first is the raw phase three. You can set up raw phase three in certain record. Uh, and then another part is the Google Cloud DNS. So let's imagine you deploy your services in raw phase three, in AWS, in uh, Google Cloud. And also you have some additional information locally that's actually uh, served by your local DNS server, or maybe your buying server, or maybe the DNS, uh, maybe core DNS itself. And in this case, you want to consolidate the information. You want to make sure uh, they, they appear as a front end, as just one uh, within one subdomain, and uh, to to your user or your customers, they don't see how you, they don't notice it's coming from Google Cloud or coming from uh, AWS or coming from the local IT. So the way it works is that you can just simply set up a profile. Uh, this is the exact profile you need. the The first entry is raw history. You you know you you can use Rafi three to specify the uh, to specify the zones uh, you wanted to capture, and then you can specify the fall through, which means uh, if a zone is uh, if a record is not available, it will fall through to the next uh, plugin, which is a Cloud DNS. Uh, you also set up a fall through so that it can continue if you. If the record, if the record that's carried by the user is it's not hitting uh, Google Cloud DNS, and of course you can uh, set up your local core DNS with uh, different plugins with different information, or even uh, connecting to uh, some uh, external DNS resolvers as as many ways as you like, and uh, you should be able to connect all the information and uh, serving the in one front end through core DNS. That's what I'm talking about. You can use core DNS as a single source of truth for, for your users. Okay. okay, now let's go a little deeper to discuss about uh, uh, how to write a, a core DNS plugin uh, in Golang. We're going to use, uh, uh, we're also going to discuss also discovery, but in this case, the setup is going to be simple. Let's say we have a, a, a VNet or VPN or VPC, and uh, the internally you want your DNS to uh, to reply IP, uh, let's say 1.1.1.1. But externally, if it's a public facing, if it's a query by the user outside of your organization, you want to reply another uh, IP address, and it can be easily done. Uh, in this setup, so let's say uh, some some user is query you to say, okay, I'm going to query example.org. You're going to say, oh, is this user coming from uh, a private IP, a private uh, uh, network, or from public network? If it's a public network, I'm going to reply one one thing. Private network, it's going to be another thing. The the demo plugin is is available in 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 GitHub, so you can certainly take a look. But I'm in this session, I'm going to only briefly walk through several functions to show you how simple it is uh, to to just come up with your own uh, with your own plugin. And in case you want to implement any complicated feature, you can expand it a little further. But I highly encourage you to use a demo plugin as a starting point if you want to achieve anything uh, anything slightly sophisticated than just a core file. Because most of the time, if you use a core file, you probably already achieve your uh, already achieve your, your goals. But in case there are some features just not a, not possible to come up with a simple core file, you can try to write uh, your plugin in Golang. So demo plugin consists of uh, three functions, and that's the only thing uh, the only things you need to cover. The first is init function, which will which is pretty standard, just to perform a one-time in, uh, initialization and register the setup function. The setup function is a part of the caddy uh, system. It will pass a configuration and uh, decide what to do for, for this plugin. And finally, the serve DNS is the core component of the, uh, of the plugin. Anything happened about your you know about your DNS query and the response will be inside the self DNS. 
uh, I'm going to show the code here. As you can see, it's fairly simple. They need plugin. It's not doing anything other than just uh, do a standard registration uh, for plugin itself with setup. Setup function will pass the uh, the configuration. In our configuration, we want to make it simple. We just want to hard code uh, 1.1.1.1 or 8.8.8.8. Uh, in this case, we don't need to pass anything. So we just say, okay, we are going to, to make sure the plugin name is demo and we're going to move on. Uh, if you decide to do additional uh, passing, you have to modify the setup, but that's a, a separate topic. And uh, here comes uh, the core components of uh, uh, plugin, the serve DNS. The serve DNS will take a message, which is a request, the DNS message. Uh, with the DNS message, that's our DNS message, right? Uh, with the DNS message, you try to construct the request and figure out the, uh, the query name. Uh, you can do a state dot name. The first two lines of state equals uh, request dot request, which will construct request. And then you can figure out the name of the query, which is simple enough. And now you're going to say, let's figure out the IP of the uh, uh, query, which uh, as you can see the next line, if a uh, if, uh, IP starts with 172 dot something or 127 dot something, it means it's a private network, within private network. The reply will be 1.1.1.1. Of course, other, you can use if else to decide what will be the other reply. So let's say the other reply is going to be 8.8.8.8. .8 and, uh, and that's all you need. You can construct the answers. After you construct the answers, you use the DNS response writer, the, the uh, second argument in the, in the function. You use that one to, uh, to write down the response. And uh, that's pretty much it for the, for the whole plugin. And you can certainly uh, uh, continue to construct a core file, as I mentioned in, in the previous uh, uh, setup section. The, we, we don't take any argument, we only accept the plugin name and demo. So the core file will be just a demo, it will invoke the plugin. Uh, the plugin has to be compiled, you know, it has to be compiled as part of the coding as a repo. So into fetch a coding as a repo, you add a demo to plugin.config. And there, there is some easy way to build. You can, you know, uh, the, you see the drag uh, command, docker run. This will give you a way to easily build everything. If you run this command, uh, somehow the binary will be available. You will see a core DNS binary on your local, uh, on your local directory. You can just invoke a core DNS and that's all. Okay, that's, uh, uh, demo plugin, and again, like I said, the, the source code is available. If you're interested in start writing your own plugins, and you, I highly encourage you to, to use this demo plugin as a starting point. And also, if you check the whole repo, the whole repo only consists of like 80 lines of Gola, so it should be simple enough. It's nothing complicated. Okay, now we are almost uh, to the end of the session. So I'm going to say, if anyone wants to contribute to coding as you have several ways to, uh, to help coding as One, you may, be, you may want to start coding as in GitHub to reach uh, 10,000 10, uh, stars go uh, sooner. And two, if your institution or organization uh, are willing to share the name, uh, uh, publicly, you can add the name to adopt the .md file in the repo. That also means that you automatically became a contributor uh, because you, you, you're going to create a PR, right? And also, if you want to go a step further, uh, you want to be a maintainer, it's also not that difficult. Uh, normally, the policy is that if you create a significant pull request, I mean, now small pull request <laughs> has to be something meaningful, has to be something important, just one. Uh, and if you can find, find a maintainer, an, an existing maintainer to sponsor you, you can be added as a maintainer. 
again, there are 28 maintainers at the moment, so I don't think you have any trouble to find someone to sponsor you if you can make one significant pull request contribution. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's it for, for the whole session. Just wonder, any, any questions or any, anything anyone want to ask? It's uh, okay. Court. Okay, so I'm trying to. Okay, so I'm trying to rephrase the question. The question is, uh, is called DNS like authoritative? So the, in the in the way DNS works, uh, you normally have a resolver, right? The core DNS is not a DNS resolver. So you can consider the core DNS as a front end of DNS. It needs to be backed by uh, by a resolver. Is a you know, uh, you, you need to have some other way to pass information from the backend to the frontend, but coding itself is not a resolver. Sorry, I, I, I probably missed your, your early comment. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, can, can you re repeat the question again? Yeah. It's uh, okay. So if if you say you don't want to talk to outside, you just want to use coding and sell everything. Uh, it certainly is possible. I mean, you can you can associate with uh, let's say a, a bind, or associate with uh, you know, uh, or maybe like a host file. I, I know some some people use uh, use a host file with like a ten thousand record and they sell that real. But yeah, John, maybe you can comment on. Yeah. So so coding itself is actually the authoritative name server. You have different backends. So most people here are probably using it in Kubernetes. But that's just one particular way to use it. And we can actually use it. It, it can accept ordinary standard DNS main, uh, uh, files, uh, bind-like main files, right? So you can use it as an ordinary authoritative name server, just like anywhere you'd use bind. Absolutely no problem. You, what it doesn't do is it doesn't do recursive resolution. So authoritative resolution, meaning it reads the data from its local files, or it reads the data from somewhere else, and serves it up directly as the authoritative name server. It can do, but if you give it, if you give it a name that isn't part of its authoritative domain that it understands, it it, it has to forward that query onto another name server. So if what you want to do is look up from the internet, or to, to internet services that aren't within your domain, then you need another name server to handle that because. A, like a, a recursive name server like Vine will navigate, it'll break the, 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 the query into its constituent labels and it'll navigate. It'll look up the root name server, it'll look up the column name server, it'll look up the Google name server, it'll look up the foo.google.com, you know, and it'll find those name servers. CordianS won't do that process. It'll, it'll, if, if you, but, but for an air gap situation, yes, absolutely, it would 100% serve your domains. You just have to give it the reference in an ordinary uh, name the, you know, uh, file format or host file yeah. you can use. But it's like, you can sort of think of our plugins as we have, we have backends that are, we, we sort of uh, differentiate between the source of the data and then how we serve the data. So the source of the data can be, backed by Google Cloud, it can be backed by um, uh, Route 53, it can be backed by a file, it can be backed by a Postgres database, it can be backed by a uh, Kubernetes API server, all of those things, but it's all just served up as DNS. Well, maybe, maybe I can say another way. If you have a Google.com, if you say, I don't know what Google.com will resolve to IP by Google, <laughs> then you can say, you can, you can set up, set up 
uh, coding as to response for any google.com request as 1.2.4 or 2.3.4 whatever anyway you want but if you say i don't know what it is i want to look into dot uh, dot then dot uh, and then look into com then look into google and see what it actually is uh, Codians will not do that so it's not a result one but it can serve all the information. If you want, to, you want your, all the information to be within coding as it definitely can do that. No, you don't, I mean, so I, I don't know what mechanism you're using to configure if you're writing your own core files. There's no, the only place an external reference shows up is in the forward plugin. So you actually have to explicitly use the forward plugin to do those external lookups. By, by default, it doesn't do that. Now, if you're in Kubernetes, then you're using a particular way to configure it that either a Helm chart or your service provider is exposing to you as a service. But the actual coordinates itself doesn't care about any of that. That's all external about how it gets configured. It's just the core file. That's how it gets configured. So we, can, we can talk about that. You mentioned the uh, Yeah. Like, uh, if, if there is a payload that's beyond 512 bytes, which is the obviously uh, requirement, is there a way that we can have coordinates? Uh, you want me to repeat the question, or you do get uh, yeah. most of what I said? So uh, you mentioned UDP was the front side protocol that's used for request response to a client. If the play payload happens to be much larger than 512 bytes, is there a mechanism in Core DNS to allow for that kind of payloads? Yeah, so, so that's a standard DNS question, really. So in DNS, uh, one, you can use TCP, because DNS supports both TCP and TCP, although by default, typically use TCP. But also you can use what's called uh, uh, eDNS, or eDNS zero, extended DNS, and you have to use that for extended, but I'm not sure. Um, but basically, it allows you to use uh, uh, up to 4,096 bytes or something, I think. Uh, or, or, I don't know, I don't remember. There's, a, there's an extra buffer you can configure. Yes, yes, the extra buffer, but I, I don't remember the exact. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's an yeah. a, a extension to DNS as opposed to for DNS. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any other question? Do you want to ask your question? No? Okay. Okay. Okay, look, I have no other questions. Sounds loud. Okay, have a great day. <laughs>